Uh, one. Please welcome Ray Holt. Leo says I can talk for four hours, but I only need two hours. <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> My story is about baseball, airplanes, and digital circuits. And all of them came together about the same time. When I was 12 years old, my neighbor was moving. He said, Ray, do you want all my radio equipment? I said, no. I didn't like it. He said, but I have a big chair. If you take my radio equipment, you can have the big chair. I said, great. <laughs> and it was like this tall. So I took everything. He said, well, let me show you how to fix radios. Open them up, blow the dust out, turn them on. If the tubes are black, you change them in this. So I started fixing radios at 12 years old, making money, $5 for radio. And I was also repairing bicycles, so by the time I was 14, I was making $100 a month. You know, radios, bicycles, so it was nice. Slides. 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 You can. <laughs> you, 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 you know, yeah. Obviously, an Italian invented this beautiful device in 1604. You may ask questions anytime, uh, get up and stretch, whatever you want. So, I did not like radios, I love baseball. All American boys love baseball. My dream was to be a professional baseball player. So I was average student in school. Uh, when I was my last year of secondary school, I played on a baseball team and uh, seven of the players played professional baseball. So I knew I was going to. I knew my day was coming that I would get a call to play professional baseball. When I graduated from uh, secondary school, they told me one thing, do not go into engineering. And they did not say why, they just said don't go into engineering. I learned later the reason they said that was because I was very bad uh, mechanically. I had very low mechanical ability. But I had good math. But engineering at that time was mechanical. So they said, don't go into engineering. So I said, that's OK. I want to play baseball. <laughs> so I go to uh, college, my first year in college, uh, not very good. And I quit. I just walked up. But the second half of that year was the baseball time, so I joined college again to play baseball. And I made the team, and the coach said, before we play the season, I have to check your academic records, your grades. And he checked the grades, and I had all Fs, zero, because I quit the first time. He said, I'm sorry, you can't play. Give me, give me five minutes in which you push the button. Okay. I have to check for the interview. Okay. 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 So keep talking. Right? Yeah. I'll, do, I'll do back. <laughs> okay. So, no baseball. A, f 
friend of mine was going to school in northern Idaho, that's up by Canada, and he was home for the summer, and he said, Ray, just come to school with me, I play football, and you can stay with me, and we'll have a fun time, why not? They had a baseball team, so, so I went up there, and I made the baseball team, and, and uh, they said, what, what do you want to study? And I said, well, not engineering. They said, well, here's the list. Look down the list and see what you want to study. And I saw forestry. Yeah, I like the outdoors, so I'll study forestry. So I signed up for forestry. For three years, I studied forestry and not engineering. But math was okay, calculus was, was good. And then the, the dean or the head man in forestry said, uh, Ray, um, your chemistry is really bad. Uh, I don't think you should stay in forestry. Uh, why don't you take this class in physics? And it was physics of electricity. Well, I didn't like electricity, but I repaired radios, so I thought, okay, I'll take it. Loved it. 100% straight A's in physics of electricity. Perfect paper, perfect form, everything. And all around me were engineers in the class. And I said, I could be an engineer, electrical engineer. And so I switched and I started over again and I changed schools and I went to a school that taught engineering, electronic engineering, hands-on. So one hour class, three hours hands-on. So I became very, very good at touching electronics, making it work, wiring, soldering, understanding failure points and stuff like that. So that was a big, big change in my life. And my last year at that school, I had to take an elective, they call it, I could pick from the list. And so I picked a class called uh, Theory of Switching Systems. I didn't quite know what that was, but it said math and it said uh, computers. So good, I'll take it. Well, today we would call it uh, uh, computer logic or binary arithmetic. So I learned how to do binary logic, binary arithmetic, and I liked it. I liked it because either it worked or it didn't work. If your logic was right, it worked. If logic was wrong, it didn't work. And that's my thinking is like that. So I really liked it. So. I graduated and I decided to work for a company that makes airplane parts, but they wanted me to design amplifiers, audio amplifiers for entertainment on airplanes. Thank you. The good news, yes. <laughs> the good news is that there is somebody with it from the Italian television to interview Gaston and you. Oh, the bad news is that he only interviews you if you are in time. So <laughs> if you right? are in time, they can wait for more for 45 more minutes. Okay, okay. Okay. okay, so we need slides. <laughs> That's a good news for us. <laughs> so, I, my first day at the company, uh, they said to me, uh, you have a computer class. I said, yes. You're the only one in the company that has a computer class. We have a special project for you. So they took me to the production area. This is where we need to show them. So they took me to the production and they said, do you know what this is? And of course I said, no, no idea. And I said, it looks like a transmission in a car. They said, no, and it's about, about this big. They said, that's a mechanical computer on the F-4 Phantom jet. That's the jet that America was using in Vietnam. They said, we want you to 
design a, com a, a solid state electronic computer that replaces that. I remember my mechanical ability is really bad because they said don't go into engineering. And now they're asking me with one computer class to replace that computer. Now, for a young engineer, I was 24 years old, first job, it was like, this is crazy. <laughs> How can they ask me to do that? <laughs> but I learned later that nobody else knew digital and didn't want to learn, and I was a young engineer. I had good hands-on, and that's what they wanted. So they, they told me it was for an airplane, that's all. They said, we do not have the contract, so in three months we think we will get the contract, so go learn computers. So for three months they let me take any class I wanted to, buy any books, just sit there and play around with digital, and that was great. Because I took a class from a very famous digital designer, and uh, read lots of books, learned about architecture. And so I was ready to go when they got the project. Um, There was a, a floating car, series, um, It's on a card this size, 40 square inches. It can only consume 10 watts of power, and it had to operate over military temperature range. So very cold, very hot. So I said, okay, I was a young engineer. I didn't know I couldn't do it. Um, and then they told us the cost and everything. So we had to look at different uh, techniques. I think that's the next slide. Uh, yeah, state of the art. So our choice was uh, TTL bipolar, which is very standard at the time, but it was very expensive and it consumed a lot of power and it would have taken a lot of chips. The other choice was MOS logic modules. So at that time, you can buy a chip with maybe four AND gates and two flip-flops, and, and you can make a computer out of it. But it would it'd be too big. It would not fit on this board. And so our only choice was to do what was called at that time large-scale integration. It was only two years old. And if we didn't use that, it just couldn't be done. Now, the people in the company that made the proposal, they didn't care. They just made the proposal and said, we can do it and give us a contract, we'll do it. But then they told me, go do it. <laughs> so I had to start doing some research on technology, uh, the companies that could make it, architectures, and just start trying to make it work. Now, there was another logic designer that worked with me. He was maybe 45 years old. He did not, he only liked blocks. That's all he liked. If you talk to him about AND gates and OR gates, he says no. If you talk to him about electricity, he says no. He didn't even like electricity, but he, he was good at drawing blocks. So together we worked on architecture, and then I would go to the uh, semiconductor company and say, can you make it? They said no. We go back, well, three times. We redesigned three times for size, for power, and for cost. And finally, after three times, we had a design that would fit the board, would do all the calculations, and they said they could make it if they wanted to. Okay. So at that time, because it's a military project, we had to get three companies to give us a prize, and then we would pick the best one. 
So we sent out our documents to American Microsystems, General Instruments, and um, uh, Rockwell. All three of them said, no, we don't want to make it. So now after a year's work, nobody wants to make it. So what do we do? So they said, stop the project. And we stopped it for one week. And then somebody came to me and said, Ray, if you had to pick a company to make it, which one would you pick? And so I picked American Microsystems because they were the ones we worked with and I liked the engineers. And then that's all I heard. And then two days later they came to me and said, okay, go to American Microsystems and start the project. I said, well, what happened? Well, I didn't know what happened until like 10 years later. But what happened was the president of my company went down to American Microsystems and said, I will buy your company for 51%, give you lots of money, you make our chips, and then I'll sell my stock back to you for a profit. They liked it. And I think the, the founder, the owners made like $2 million. So that's how we got them to make our chips. So, hold on the slides. No, back up, back up. So this is the block diagram for the, the whole box. Now the box was called the Central Air Data Computer. And so it had sensors, power supply, uh, and then the, the computer inside. But we also had analog to digital converters, 14-bit uh, and digital analog computers, and then we had switches from the pilot, and then the, this is the computer with the microprocessor. Next slide. This is the final architecture of the microprocessor. Now, all the math we had to do, we really needed a one megahertz computer. But the technology would not go that fast at military uh, temperature. Because they had to be real conservative and the line spacing had to be wide. So the fastest the chips would go would be one third of a megahertz. So we came up with an architecture where we could have the main CPU and then in parallel, look like coprocessors. We'd have a multiplier coprocessor and a divider coprocessor. And everything was 20 bits. And so we would process 20 bits and we could store it in memory, random access storage. So this is RAM. And then we'd pull the data and maybe divide and store it, pull the data, multiply, or go back to the CPU for adding and subtracting. So that's, and everything was going on in parallel. So we could be adding two numbers here, and dividing two 20-bit numbers here, and multiplying two 20-bits here at the same time. So we just had to write the program, or we knew what we were doing. So this is the specifications on the digital part of the microprocessor. So one third of a kilohertz, that was considered very, very fast. Calculators at that time ran about 100 kilohertz maybe. So we were really pushing the technology. Now this is P-channel, MOS technology, second year. So 1968, 1970. Um, can I, can I just add that this implies that Moore's law was flawed since the beginning. How long do I know? You want me to talk about that? No, no, okay. no. no. Okay. The airplane uh, dynamics to fly the plane required that everything be updated 18 times a second. So all the math for the airplane Every 18th of a second, we had to read sensors, calculate, move wings, flaps, and then do it again every 18th of a second. And so in an 18th of a second, we divided that into 512 operation times. And then each operation time, we divided it into uh, 20 bits. So we could do 9,370 operations every 18th of a second. Oh, every second, every second. But we can do it three times. 
So we had a lot of computing capability crammed into a small space, but we had to figure out how to, how to program it and make it happen. So this is what we ended up with after we were all finished, and I'll tell you after this how we did the programming. So the F14, the first F14 required 5,490 20-bit multiplies, 1,922 20-bit divides, and then all of this. So we had to, you know, make it all happen at the same time. Now the Navy, the United States Navy did ask us, uh, please leave some capability in the chips for expansion, for adding more equations, for changes of stuff. So this was the maximum we could do, but this is what the first first program did. So we had a lot of a lot of extra room. Okay. So we ended up with six six chips. So this is not a single chip CPU, and the 4004 is not a single chip CPU. So but we have one main CPU chip, and then the 20 bit divider parallel divider 20 bit parallel multiplier. Uh, RAM, ROM for program storage, and then we had what we call steering logic. Uh, that's what we used to go between the multiplier divider and logic. You guided the data as it went around. And all we needed was the chip. We needed no more, no extra logic. Now, of course, we needed multiple read-only memories because of program storage. So this is what the first, this is what we were able to get on one board. One multiplier, one parallel divider, one CPU, three uh, chips to move the logic, move the data around, uh, three random access memories, RAM, and 19 ROMs to store the program. And this represents how many transistors was on each chip. So the, all, the, all the chips together was seven, 74,442 transistors. Now at that time, that's kind of was the measurement of your power or measurement of how big your chips are. This ROM was the biggest chip made at that time. It had 3,268 transistors. And the ROM represents the programming. So the programming part of the computer was stored in the ROM. And I'll tell you in a little bit how we did that program. So this is a picture of the chips. Uh, so this is the, the RAM, that's the ROM. Uh, this is the steering. This is the uh, uh, CPU. And these two are the multiply divider. Now how many here have uh, designed uh, adders, binary adders? Is there any logic designers here you've you designed binary adders? Well, if you have a 20-bit multiplier, you have to have 20 adders. And so you add, shift, add, shift, add, shift. So you notice on the chip here, if you look, it's kind of the same thing here, 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 here. Well, there's 20 of them. So each one of these is an adder. But because there's 20, we couldn't have 20 big ones. So we had to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So I would do the logic design and I would go to the chip manufacturer and they would they would lay it out and they said, no, too big because we have to get 20 of them. Go back, redesign, and try to get more clever in the logic. But we also had what's called carry look ahead. So you had two numbers and you had to predict the carry at the end because it all happened at the same time. So there's a lot of logic on there for predicting the carry. So I set the 20-bit parallel multiplier, and this is 20-bit parallel divider. And these are the actual chips, which you saw in the book. These are the same chips that were in the book. So these were the first chips off the production line. Now you may ask, well, how, how, did I, how did I keep them? <laughs> this is a secret project. Well, the Navy, the United States Navy was a little bit sloppy. 
Uh, you know, they, they sent a, product, a promotional person, no offense, to take pictures and everything and big deal, and then they just left them laying there. So I said, mm, I think they're important. So, <laughs> so I just kept them and uh, nobody said anything. So that's why I have them. <laughs> they would have put them in the trash. Honestly, nobody knew that this was important. They just knew it's working and that's all they needed to know it's working. Okay. Okay, this is the number of instructions. So every chip had, had its own set of instructions. So there's a total of 133 instructions for all the chips. So how do we program it? We had no assemblers, no compilers, we didn't have time. By the time the hardware was working, we only had like three or four months to write the program. And then we had to get the chips made. The read-only memory chips took three months. So after we think it was working, we had to wait three months to see if it's gonna work. And if it didn't, three more months. So we, it had to be right. Or we had to convince ourselves it's right. So we developed a software simulator, and my brother was able to, he was a programmer from Stanford University, so they let him work with me. He developed a software simulator that simulated every transistor in Fortran. So that's, that's like unheard of. <laughs> But that's all we had. Fortran running on the company's IBM uh, 1104, 1103. And that's, that's a slow computer compared to today. So big program running on. So every time we ran a simulation, it took time. And we couldn't do the whole thing at one time. We just had to do little pieces. And then I developed the hardware prototype. So we took standard chips, like four gates in a module, and we tried to build it all up. And you know, Bill showed it in Harvard. So we had two ways of testing the program. Uh, next. This was the typical mathematics, and it's typical for um, for the atmosphere because it's all pressure, and I guess all the pressure differences are all represented by polynomials. So we had two inputs from the airplane. This is my little model. And on the front of every airplane, commercial and military, there's a, there's a pressure tube. And it's down and sticking forward. And that's for dynamic pressure for when the plane's moving. And then underneath is one that goes down and backwards. And that measures, measures the pressure as if the plane is standing in the air. So between dynamic and static pressure, they can calculate altitude, ground speed, airspeed, angle, um, several other things. Temperature? Temperature. Outside temperature. You like in a car, you know, out temperature in the air? They can do it from pressure. <laughs> so we had lots of equations like this to do. <coughs> and it was all polynomials. So I was very happy in college that I, I at least understood polynomials. I can't say I love them. No college student loves polynomials, but at least I understood them. Okay. So this is a typical equation. It is the equation for angle of attack. And that's the, just whatever the angle is, x, y, z, three-dimensional angle. Now why, why would you need to know the angle of attack of a fighter jet airplane? Any idea? Okay, it has missiles, and so when you fire the missile, you want it to go perpendicular to the plane, yep. <laughs> and not this way. So the angle of attack always told the missile system how to drop and fire the missile. Okay, next. Uh, and this is the, the rest. So this is the kind of math we did. We, and we did a divide of the static and dynamic pressure. We had to scale it by 1.3. And then we had to limit the values and then subtract this. And every 18 of a second, we'd do that. And then the answer would go into other polynomials for, for other kinds of uh, calculations. Okay, next. 
Right. Okay. Programming had to be done in ones and zeros. Binary program. Because no time for compilers and assemblers. So in two actually in two months I was able to program the whole thing in binary. But you had to be logical in doing it so you didn't miss an equation or miss a constant or whatever was necessary. So the first step after the mathematics, the next thing I did was make a chart like this of every equation. So read the pressure, adjust the pressure, and then take it through the steps to do something with it. And then there was maybe 40 of these. So for every equation I had to decide every step necessary. And then I had to take all those 40 and put them in time. So 18th of a second, 512 operations. So I had to decide which operation would do this, and which would do this, and which would do this. But of course, I couldn't do this until this was done. You know, I had to go in order. But I could take this value and store it in RAM for a while and then bring it back and finish this. So it's a time sequence uh, mathematics, but I didn't have to do it in every time slot. I could delay it. Okay, next. So this is the drawing in time. So that told me that a 20 bit multiply here by this value and this value, and then I had to do some adding and subtracting uh, of the result of this. So this is like the polynomial, and then. Um, like right here, this would represent, I take the answer here and I store it in RAM until I needed it here. So all of the equations, all the math, the 5,000 multiplies, was all on paper like this. And then from this, because I knew the chips, I designed the chips, I knew how to make the math work on the chips. I, I suggest you to drop some details. Okay, we're almost finished. So this is, this is the program, <laughs> ones and zeros from that drawing, and lots and lots of sheets like this. Then we take this data and we put it into the software simulator, into the hardware, and then we would test it, test it, test it, and make sure the wings moved. And this was the very first airplane to move the wings by computer. So it's called fly-by-wire. So if the computer stopped, the airplane stopped. Uh, so this is just a printout of the read-only memory, so this is the actual program. And when the chips were made, we would send them this, but we'd send them a paper tape before floppies. Just a big paper tape with holes in it, and that's the program. And we just hope that they read it right. Uh, and then my brother was able to... Uh, take my time drawing and print it back out on what was called a CalComp printer, it was a graphics printer. And so we had a, uh, a printout and showing all the values, intermediate values, so we can, we can check on the simulator if the values are right. Okay. Now, this is the last part of the story. The program was all finished. And the United States Navy said, uh, this is like, six months before the project was supposed to, the airplane was supposed to fly. They said, uh, send us your report on the history of your chips. It's called the MTBF, mean time between failure. Because they did not like you using components that had no history. They want to make sure the components are perfect. Long history of never failing. Well, this is two-year-old technology, no history. So we had to tell them that, and they were very mad, and they uh, said stop the project, and they said we're going to give it to someone else, which they couldn't, and Bendix, Bendix was the next, and Bendix, Bendix said we don't want it. So they came back to me and they said, okay, while the plane is flying, can you test all your chips for failure? 100%. Now, 
never done it before. <laughs> and I didn't quite know how to do it, but it turned out to be really simple because, uh, as I always say, uh, 3 plus 3 is 6, and if you get 4, something's wrong. So I said, okay, I'll just figure out some 1s and 0 bit patterns, and I'll run them through the multiply divider and the adder, and if I get the wrong answer, then there's a problem. There's a shorted line, an open line, a bad transistor. So I came up with a pattern, and we were able to 100% check the, uh, really all the logic, except the multiplying <laughs> divider, and it was really, really <coughs> complex. And we were able to 98% check that. Well, it was fine. Now, what happens if it says, okay, we found a bad chip, the computer's not working right, the Navy said, okay, put two computers in the plane. So now we have two boards, two complete computers. If one fails, switch over to the other one. So we had a parallel coprocessor, microprocessor, dual redundancy, and then we had to tell the pilot if there was a problem, turn the light on. Well, the pilots don't like lights, so they said, take it out. We don't care if a computer fails. We're going to finish our mission, and we'll go back. And so that's what happened. Okay, next. This is the hardware prototype. So this was the sensor, the pressure sensor. Uh, static dynamic from the ports. This is the logic board, logic implementation. So all of this became the chips, and this is the gauges for the pilot. A long time, people would ask me, okay, what, what did you really do? What, tell us what you think you've accomplished or the project accomplished. Now, I want to make a point. This was not me. It was 25 people. Two of us on the logic, on the computer, but we had designers for the power supply, the A to D, the D to A, the box, the board. All of them, highly, highly qualified engineers. The best group of engineers I ever worked for. Uh, and many of them went on to become uh, uh, semiconductor chip designers uh, after this project. So this is what I uh, feel that we've accomplished. I've been promoting this about 10 years. Nobody has ever doubted it, uh, not even Intel. Uh, and then, from a digital designer point of view, these are some of the techniques that we use that looking back were, were kind of unique. Uh, so we did execution pipelining. That means the instruction for the next math was sent to the computer while the last math was being worked. So we overlapped uh, the computation and the instructions. So that saves some time in transferring data. Uh, parallel processing, the coprocessors. Intel didn't do a coprocessor until like 10 years later. Um, a read only memory. Uh, normally they would be addressed from the outside the chip, but we actually put a counter inside the chip so we can just say next, 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 or jump. Um, Okay. So the airplane lasted uh, 30 years. It's the longest production airplane in the United States. Uh, I think the fourth year of the airplane, uh, President Nixon sold 100 F-14s to Iran when Iran was friendly to the United States. And then you know Iran did not become friendly later. So they have a, right now they have 30 F-14s that still fly. When the, F-14 was retired in the United States, our military department said, destroy everyone, shred them up. And so one by one, they've been destroying all the F-14s. And I understand there's about 20 left right now. I have been trying to get a computer out of it, <laughs> at least for a museum or something, and they said no. The, the, law, the law says destroy them, so they're destroying them. Uh, so all the F-14s in the museums in the United States have no electronics. They pull them all out. Uh, but at least they save some of the planes. Uh, when the airplane retired, now I had a website. The web I said, the airplane retired. Every country knows how it works. They said, no, Iran still is flying the airplane. We 
take out some information. And it's mainly did. Have you been for some flights on it? Did I? Yes. No, I tried. <laughs> I did not see the airplane with my eyes until 2006, 2012. 2012. I could not see one. I, I was turn around and get out of here. <laughs> okay. Also for testing to check during the flight, you have never been inside? No. The computer worked the first time, and they took the box, and they put the lid on it, and they sent it to Grumman Aircraft across the country to New York, and it worked there. And I heard that the first computer, the same design, worked for all 700, and they had no problems. So, good one. Amazing. <laughs> well, the technology. 30-year-old technology is still flying. Yeah. And that's, that's amazing. So the company that made the chips did an amazing job. And that was American Microsystems. So this has been a 10 <laughs>